Aloha, this is Rob Hack with another episode of Exporting from Hawaii. Today I'm very pleased to have my friend Kanzo Nara. He's president of QP Web, and we're going to be discussing some technical issues about exporting from Hawaii, mostly around the areas of e commerce, what's new and trendy and bilingual and multilingual websites and social media, marketing in Japan, topics like this. So welcome, Kanzo. Thank you, Rob, for having me. Oh, thank you very much for being here. So tell us a little bit about QP Web. What is QP Web? Okay, QP Web is a company I started in 2006. Uh, we do bilingual web design and bilingual web marketing. And mostly that's Japanese and so usually we do uh, customers that are Japanese trying to get into the U.S. market or American clients trying to get into the Japanese market. Sometimes it makes this work. I see. If there's a company that comes to you and says, we'd like to do another language, yes. not English, not Japanese, what do you find is sort of number three, number four right number now? Number three, I would say, is a, a close tie with Chinese and Korean. Oh, really? Yes. And the Chinese would be for mainland China or Taiwan? Uh, uh, for Chinese, like language-wise, uh, it, it will be for uh, Mandarin. Yeah, so we're not really the country, but mostly more the language. Okay, that's fine. Um, the, you started the company in 2006. Yes. Do you host websites, or are you just building them? Uh, we do both. Yeah, we host websites and also develop. Okay, so most of the websites you make are bilingual. Yes. Who does the... Translations, either way, like a Japanese company oh. comes to you and they, they yeah, want an actually, English. Actually, I, I do. I, I speak both English, English and Japanese fluently. Oh. Okay. As well. Great. Great. And um, what do you think is the percentage of your business? Is it um, Japanese companies coming to you that want an English version or the other way around? Uh, I would say about 50% of our clients are local here in Hawaii, about 30% from Japan, 20%. Oh. Yeah, and in the fifty percent Hawaii, I would include both Japanese and like local business. Okay, great. Um, most of the companies that come to you and they ask you to build a website, do you consult with them on where the website is hosted, or is that not important? Uh, it's not important uh, as long as the server is not antiquated. Sometimes my clients like to use Japanese hosting companies. Japanese hosting companies are usually a couple years behind what U.S. companies are. So in that case, I would redirect them to the proper hosting. That's interesting because um, if you're in Japan, yes, the Japanese mobile web, but also just land-based web in a Wi-Fi zone or at a home or an office is actually really good yes compared to Hawaii or even faster. the U.S. Yes. mainland. So that's interesting that their server. Farms might be a couple of years behind. Yeah, it, it is kind of interesting. But uh, the reason is Japanese uh, hosting, a lot of time, they piggyback off of uh, servers like overseas, like in Germany or in the US. So basically, a lot of times you're subleasing a server. Yeah, but here in the US, when you, when you uh, get a contract with a hosting company, you usually host it with them. Now, we'll come back to talk about QP Web, but I know. You also have the I Do Web School, where you're teaching people how to make their own web. You can talk about that. Oh, yes. Uh, I started the I Do Web School back in 2015. Uh, the biggest, biggest reason was, you know, websites are getting easier and easier to make. You know, uh, compared to 10, 15 years ago, where you had to code everything. Now we're working off a lot of uh, content management systems and platforms where a developer like me would make the, the wireframe for the website, and then the client can start adding content on their own. So that's where the I Do Web School came in, where we train uh, professionals at companies or IT departments to kind of run their own website, make their own website, and keep it going for a couple of years, or even longer. Well, that's a great idea. So the content management system, do you have a preferred one, WordPress? Or yes, I would say WordPress is the best content management system. So from a multilingual standpoint, if you're making a multilingual yes. website, WordPress can function smoothly in both languages. Yes, uh, they had a few issues up until twenty, I would say twenty fifteen or so, but uh, they resolved that now. And the newer version of WordPress, 
versus five and up uh, has uh, excellent modular. So if you were a small company here in Hawaii and you had just a few employees, maybe even part-time employees, but they needed to log into the, to the website. Yes. One speaks, we, reads English better, uh -huh. one reads Japanese better. Can the CMS switch back and forth for that? Uh, no, it cannot, yeah. And the people need to be careful when they're making a website and multilingual, uh, multilingual is not to use too many uh, fancy digits and widgets out yeah. there. You want to have two separate websites for a multilingual. I've seen websites where they have, you know, three, four languages on one domain, and they you have the tiny button that switches over to the language. You don't want to do that. You want to have separate domains, so the search engine can look at one website and say this is in even English, because uh, of the text ratio. Whatever language has more characters is going to be the one the search engine determines. It, determines it. That's interesting. Yeah. So let's say, for example. I own example.com. I don't own it as an example. <laughs> yeah. If I were going to make a Japanese website, do you recommend I have example.com and then a subdomain on that, or do I buy example.jp? Uh, you don't want to do the JP for other countries because that's a geo targeted domain. What you want to do is probably do a subdomain, which is jp.example.com. That way, it treats it as a separate website, and uh, your language text ratio doesn't get gobbled. Then, um, how about when you're do you do you consult in search engine optimization? Yes, yes, we're we're big on market. So, with search engine optimization, how would you use different keywords to make sure that target market was coming mm -hmm. to? Do you consult on those keywords as well? Yes, yes. Uh, and well, how it works is you want to have, there's a lot of good SEO tricks over the years. And uh, there was a lot of uh, interesting kind of back end tricks you could use 15 years ago. But you know, Google has been getting better and better. And they focus now on what's called natural content. So basically, you want to have good content, good information on your website that's original. Based on that, then we start setting up keywords. So it's not really the keywords and then the website or the website. It's more the content of that page and then the keywords. How often should a company update? I've heard you should do it daily, weekly, at least monthly, but is there really any support for that? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the, the frequency of update is recorded by the Google uh, search engine robot. And uh, the more frequently you update, the more the search engine robot visits you. So let's say a website like CNN would post several articles a day. They get scrolled several times throughout the day, and each time it gets a timestamp, you know, 12 p.m. and November 12th, and so on. But an average website only gets scrolled maybe every three weeks, three to four weeks. Now, yeah. we'll venture off down the side here for social can you tie in your social media to your website such that as you refresh your social media, that is refreshing your website along with it? Is that helpful strategy? Uh, it is for the average viewer to your site. But uh, search engine-wise, it doesn't have any effect. So what you can do is bring in your Instagram gallery or your Facebook thread and incorporate it into your website. So when viewers come to your website, it looks like you have new pictures on there, new posts. But uh, those are feeds, so they don't get uh, read in by the Google search engine. Um, particularly in Japan, many people forget that Yahoo still is fairly strong. In yes. Not really in the U.S. In, in terms of search. Yes. Do your clients have to be cognizant of that if they're working in Japan? Do they need to build things mm -hmm. that are Yahoo friendly or? Not come into play. Uh, not anymore. Yahoo used to have their own search engine robot, but uh, President Son, the the chairman of Yahoo Japan, actually outsourced their search engine robot to Google back in two thousand and nine. So right now, uh, all the same SEO criteria get carried over to Yahoo. Does Bing come into play there? 
Uh, yeah, Bing, Bing is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a huge share. It's, it's probably less than 2%. Okay. All right, so still, if you're a small Hawaii company trying to export to Japan, if you are more or less Google-oriented, or okay. For organic searches, yeah. But, but for paid searches, we do need to, to cater towards Yahoo. Okay. And you, your company can export to that. Yes, uh, that will be more uh, SEM. Okay. Um, how about, let's, let's stay on the subject of speed of web development. I think most people in the Hawaii, the United States, you have. But in Japan, other parts of Asia, Korea, it's more ubiquitous even than you know, people on the web. Yes. And I think a lot of that comes down to, when you think about it, that. In Hawaii, we're driving a lot. In Japan, a lot of people will spend many hours per day in public transportation on the bus, yeah. on a train, on a subway, and perhaps a combination of that. And there's a lot of time they have mm -hmm. to actually look at their phones and yeah. do things that, that they wouldn't have, they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. There's nothing else to do. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep. But I see when I'm in, in Tokyo, well, everybody's on their phone. That's a great time to be Definitely. shoppers. Definitely. Yeah. So, do you consult on how to make websites mobile friendly? Yes. the The number one strategy right now is to make your website uh, responsive, responsive to that. And by doing so, you can have one website that works on a tablet, a smartphone, or on a desktop. Most activity, do you think, from Japan, buying something from Hawaii or looking for products, not just, is that done from a desktop or from mobile? Do you have any data? Uh, the, the data is, it's not so much just searches in general. We're looking at preliminary searches, secondary searches, and third searches. So the data shows now that preliminary searches are 82% done on mobile. So people are searching for information and products on your phone. They might save it or share it with a friend. Then they might look on it a second time. But uh, we're looking more, the, the purchasing part probably comes down to the third time. So they find the product they want early in the morning, they recheck it during the afternoon, they go home at night and they turn on their computer and they actually shop. shop. That's when they buy it. Yes. But the preliminary search is done. On your, on your smartphone. Yeah. So that's the entrance to everything. And so, I, I also know this by uh, traveling, say, in Washington, D.C., New York. This, if you're underground in a subway in those cities, generally, your mobile uh -huh. phone doesn't work. Oh, it you doesn't work know, on these phones? Only, be, oh, okay. only when you get to a station. Oh, I see. I see. And you kind of re-log into uh -huh. the system. But in Japan, it's quite seamless underground. Uh, I found there's a few dead spots, but generally speaking, the underground internet uh -huh. is pretty speedy. So, people can search consistently for their 90 minute which is different from most of these other cities. We'll, we'll come back to this right after the break. Uh, we'll take a quick break right now of exporting from Hawaii. We'll be right back with Hanzo Nama. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Our flagship energy show among the six energy shows we have is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. It plays every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Come around and see us. Learn about energy. Keep current on energy on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha.
Aloha, back with Rob Hack, exporting from Hawaii, and Konzo Nara from QT Web Corporation and the I Do Web School. We're talking really about exporting to Japan, uh, but we could be conceivably talking about exporting to anywhere. It's just with Japan, we have to be very careful about that. Yes. So, do you have any comments um, about the Japanese language and how that? Years in websites. I think of a lot of American uh, Hawaii-based companies. They're making a website, and they decide: Should I use Helvetica, mm -hmm. Arial, New Times Roman? Yeah, Some yeah, conversations yeah, like that. But in Japanese, there's also fonts yes. that should or shouldn't be used, or in email or social media or uh -huh. website. Can you just briefly talk about that? Well. Technically, the Japanese language isn't very uh, HTML friendly. Uh, there's only basically two types of fonts you can use in HTML. Uh, the rest you have to use uh, Google Fonts. And Google Fonts is a system where you kind of piggyback off of Google and make your fonts look more pretty. But that kind of decreases your load time to your website. So it's kind of a catch-22. You can have pretty fonts on a heavy website or simple fonts on a faster website. So, if, again, you would consult the company. Yes. And tell them use this. Now, yes. what if you're a, if you're a, a natural product company, uh -huh. uh, new, young, you're marketing to a certain crowd. Mm -hmm. Is there a type of Japanese font that you want compared to a traditional? You know, you look at it, you say, "Oh boy, that this is like a pre-war font document." Yeah, yeah. Well, that's actually an interesting point. There, there are so many fonts out there. Uh, also, like when you go into the Japanese language itself, you know you have calligraphy for the right. Japanese or Chinese. There, there's even calligraphy fonts you can use to make your uh, your fonts look more kind of traditional, old school, and so on. Actually, one of our logos is used with Suji, right. the calligraphy. So you, you can use kind of like the old old school one to make it look trendy too, if you want. But there's a large variety of fonts out there. So to be very fast loaded, mm -hmm. you should stick to some of these fonts that are based on the, the Google default library. Ones, yes. Okay. Um, you and I have talked briefly about AMP. Yes. Can you explain to the audience very briefly about AMP? Yes. AMP is mostly a U.S. thing, uh, mainly Google-based. It's the abbreviation for Accelerated Mobile Page. And the funny thing is, in Japan and Korea, they have very fast internet speeds, so they don't really need AMP. Their pages load right away. But uh, here's the catch. We have 1.5 million Japanese visiting us from Japan. Once they, once they get here, they're going to turn on their phones, and their internet kind of piggybacks off of our system. So if the web page is slow, it's not going to load that fast. But if you develop your web pages with AMP, they'll, uh, their pages will load really fast. I'm talking about 0.12 seconds versus the average load time might be 1.5 seconds. A lot so, are you advising clients to be AMP compliant? Yes, yeah, especially for services like restaurants or spas where people are searching for their services once they get here, mm -hmm. like post arrival versus pre arrival. Yeah, it really helps a lot because, uh, you know, when you're out there, you're busy, you want to find information right away. Quick. Yeah, quickly. And the AMP, even though you might notice it, they have the kind of tiny lightning mark next to it on search engine. Right. And if you click on that, it loads so fast. So people are starting to click on that more than the other regular search results. Um, speaking about post arrival versus pre arrival, so I look at it like there's really three different kinds of Japanese customers as a Hawaii company. One is a Japanese customer in Japan. Maybe they've never been to Hawaii, never will come to Hawaii, but they'd like to sell their product. Then the, the second Japanese customer is somebody who is planning a trip to Hawaii, yes. and they do a lot of research about what they'd like to eat, buy, eat before they go. Uh -huh. Then there's the people that you talked about, post-arrival, uh -huh. post who are more spontaneous, and they're looking for right now, they're going to be in the next hour or so, from a social media standpoint, how do you, how are we 
as Hawaii companies, how are we best able to get to those people? Should we be using Instagram, Facebook, Twitter? Does Mixi still exist? Is there anything uh, there? It's kind of, kind of dying out. It's not as trendy as before. So what is the main source of people? I would say for the age group of 15 to about 30 would be Instagram. And from 30 up to 60 would be Facebook. And do you advise, as you said before, for a website, we should have two different domains, a sort of English yes. website and then a Japanese yes. one, or a totally different domain, or at least a subdomain. Would that be the same for social media? Should you have an Instagram Japan account and an Instagram, I mean, J Japanese account and an Instagram uh -huh. English account? What are uh, your clients? You, you, can have, you can have both if you're going to keep uh, the content the same. And when I mean the content the same, if you're going to post, like, if you're going to post two pictures a day on Instagram, you got to do the same two on Japanese too. Otherwise, it's going to get lopsided. And one is going to have more information, and the lesser one is going to start to kind of fade out on the grid. But if you have, you know, official Japanese Instagram, official English Instagram, they have the same quant quantity, then it's effective. But for a lot of businesses, it's kind of hard to maintain two different languages. So for a you know, small, medium-sized company, I recommend just using one account and posting all the languages. Do Japanese readers of a social media, yes. do they get irritated if there's posts in Korean or Portuguese? Well, uh, Facebook is very good with this. They are coming up with uh, different types of settings you can do in the back, the back end, where you can only accept uh, languages in your native language, or you can have multi languages. You can do the same for posting too. So you can have your uh, Facebook account uh, allow Chinese users to like comments or block them if you want. So they're getting more into multilingual aspects of that, and they're, and they're very good with it so far. So one thing we've talked about. Japan, like it's one big monolithic entity, but it isn't. Tokyo is much different from Osaka. And then where you were born in yeah. Hokkaido, that's <laughs> much different yeah, from definitely. Okinawa yeah. or what have you. So, how, how is there a difference locally in Japan about e commerce activity in Tokyo versus not? Yes, I would say uh, people in the countryside, especially the younger generation in the countryside, are probably more uh, internet savvy because they're just not in the location where you can go to the nearest department store and buy the latest thing. Like cities like Tokyo, London, and New York, you can find anything. Maybe. But if you go, let's say, where I'm from, up in Hokkaido, you know, it's a really small town and nothing much out there. The closest city is like two, three hours away. So uh, younger people want to order stuff. Remember, you know, like back when I was younger, we, we had to order stuff in magazines. Postcard in the back, yeah, scribble there. But yeah, the, you want what's the younger people want what's new, and they're more savvy with purchasing. So. From a marketing standpoint, if a Hawaii company is doing something online, yeah. should what what do you recommend? The first market, it's a difficult question because you don't know the product. But yeah. Generally speaking, do most people target Tokyo first? And I mean, these are enormous cities. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. And, uh, in most cases, I would recommend we do the entire country to start off with. And then once we start getting in data, then we start focusing more on it. Yeah, it's the same for the U.S. here, too, depending on whatever product. You know? Sometimes you might have the East Coast, West Coast people buying it compared to, like, Midwestern. Uh, the same as Japan. A lot of your, once you do the campaign, you might have Osaka and Tokyo getting a lot of hits. But might be a different so we, we really just got to kind of try it out first and then start making a, a topic for it could be a whole other show or a series of shows is shipping from hawaii if somebody buys something on a website yes. based in hawaii and they want to ship it to japan that's a very difficult thing everybody yes. everybody yes. understands that the cost of shipping is high however i know that there is a lot of data that suggests Free shipping huh? triggers people to buy much more quickly than if they look at a product and uh -huh. then there's a separate shipping price. Have you dealt with any companies here that are shipping from their people? They make an order from Japan and then they ship it directly from Hawaii. Is there any 
Anybody doing that? Uh, your clients? <clears throat> it's getting actually fewer. I'm getting fewer, but uh, the product has to be kind of a, a niche product. They're not so much buying things like maybe just uh, average T-shirts or you know, souvenir things that they might buy easier in Japan or find on Amazon. Mm. Japan. If it's more of a, it has, you know, it has to be an authentic Hawaii product, like let's say hula product. That that's definitely something people want to buy that's authentic from Hawaii. Then they will jump through the hoops and do the shipping and pay the taxes. And stuff. That makes sense. Um, I I do believe that the premium products from Hawaii are the ones that can absorb a bit of a higher shipping cost. Um, the last topic we'll talk about, you just made a nice segue, is Amazon Rock. Uh -huh. Now, those are strong in Japan. Yes. Um, they, but they have differences between them. Do you consult to any companies on how to work with Amazon or Rock 10? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And uh, for most cases, I would recommend for, for companies that are only here in the U.S., I would recommend doing Amazon just because they're kind of more, uh, they're a U.S.-based company, so they're kind of more, more open to other companies selling in Japan. Which is Rakuten, you have to have an incorporated company in Japan. And they do have some private accounts. And Rakuten is a lot more, it's a larger share. They have the biggest share of uh, online shoppers right now. But they have a lot of specific plans to get started, so it might be kind of hard to figure out where to get so Amazon is maybe easier to see. Okay, great. So with that, we will wrap up this episode of exporting from Hawaii. Just to make sure, Konzo, people can find you at qp-web, W-E-B dot com. That's your website. Your email is nara, N-A-R-A, at qpwanted yes, dot com. And you can be reached by telephone at 808. 343-4040. So thank you again very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Your, your knowledge on uh, e-commerce is fantastic, particularly this international topic. So this is Rob Hack wrapping up another episode of Exporting from Hawaii. We'll see you again in two weeks. Mahalo.